the educational process is an example for us about the way things color glasses and so on. But yeah. Yeah. So, so for me, it's interesting to see, and, and maybe as we're taking the discussion in international studies, that we don't have some um, homogeneous separation of us and them, and so on, but it is also about collaboration and learning. And then it's the one who decided to make as well. So, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to move on immediately to Martha's talk. Um, and um, Martha is um, a political psychologist, also an author, and in fact she brought some of her books, uh, some copies of her books, Your Voice, Your Vote, that you can uh, purchase afterwards. Uh, she writes on uh, women's um, issues, and uh, she's the co-founder of the Center for Advancement of Public Policy, a research and policy analysis organization in Washington, D.C. She serves as a money editor for Mead Magazine and is a syndicated newspaper columnist and a frequent blogger for Huffington Post. I think the last book of last week that she included uh, in a post it. And uh, in 2012, she launched the new national show on public radio, Equal Time with Martha Burke. Her latest book, Your Voice, Your Vote, The Savvy Woman's Guide to Power, Politics, and the Change We Need, is a news magazine book selection. Uh, the 2008 edition of the book uh, won the New Mexico Book Award for Best Political Book of that year. And her previous uh, book was titled, titled Cult of Power, Sex Discrimination in Corporate America and What Can Be Done About It. That was written in, that was published in 2005. And um, it is an honor, and I'm um, sure so it's going to be <coughs> another stimulating and exciting lecture like I know Martha, only Martha can do. And here you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> I was in uh, Ojo Caliente over the weekend uh, with my husband on a leaf peeping trip. And all of a sudden, uh, my phone came to me and it said, while you are in a foreign country, you cannot make or receive calls. <laughs> so just so you know where you live. <laughs> uh, we are going to be talking about a lot of foreign countries in this presentation and certainly uh, our own. Uh, this is past to leadership. How do we get from here to there? Uh, we get there by a variety of hooks and crooks and, and methods. Uh, we're going to talk about those and give you some examples. Uh, women are now the majority in the world, and as I'm fond of saying, we actually in this country can control any election. Uh, we are the majority of the population, we're the majority of uh, registered voters, and we're the majority that actually show up at the polls. So we could control any election, we don't usually, and that's true in countries around the world. Uh, we're getting better, uh, but we're, we're not there yet. Certainly uh, not there in terms of leadership, both politically, culturally, uh, any way you want to cut it, uh, we, we are not caught up with men. Uh, but I think to know how to do it, we have to know where we uh, have come from. Wrong button. Uh, so I want to talk about, a little bit about where we are now. Uh, where are women in the world? The question about Cuba was, I think very relevant. I have to tell you that I was in Cuba in 2010, my one and only trip. I enjoyed it very much. And boy, was I uh, disabused of a, a long-held uh, belief I had. I have always thought that the power dynamic uh, resides in money, either in the household or in a country, that if women made the same as men, uh, if women were equally economically powerful, uh, we would have uh, a much more balanced uh, bit of power 
all through the culture. And I thought, well, Cuba is going to be really different because, as you said, uh, they have constitutional equality. The, the uh, economic model from the time of the revolution was built on equal pay. So most of the women that I talked to said, yes, we do make the same money as the men doing the same jobs. It's not a problem here. And I said, well, so how do you feel about your equality compared to uh, the men here? And they said, we're not. And I said, why not? Because they still don't want to do the dishes. <laughs> well, that woke me up because I had always thought if we made the same money, we would have the same power in the household and out. Not so. We still have many barriers culturally. So I will talk about those. But uh, the Global Gender Gap Index is uh, done by the World Economic Forum, and it, it judges uh, 133 countries on um, the equality between women and men on four, four different parameters. They are up there, economic participation and opportunity, and that includes how many people have jobs, uh, how is the pay compared to uh, women and men, overall income uh, between women and men, and how many professionals uh, are working between women and men. And I do want to say that uh, the way this this whole bit of data is going to be presented is you might have a, a relatively undeveloped country but still have near parity between women and men on, on some variables and uh, education is a good example. You might have one that has a coefficient of maybe 98. I mean the women and men are pretty equal on educational attainment, but that could be because nobody gets to go to school very much. <laughs> so we have to be a little bit careful about how we look at look at these data. But uh, so we have that we have educational attainment, which is basically how many kids are in school, how many people are in school uh, at every level, and what gender they are. Uh, health and survival is a very interesting one because. It includes ratio of females to males at birth, and some countries, as we know, uh, have had policies that favor male children. Uh, it also captures life expectancy, uh, health and survival, in terms of things like disease and violence. And in many countries, including our own, um, women are victims of fatal violence more often than men. Uh, they do not have, in some countries, access to medicine to prevent disease or adequate food. So all that is captured in health and survival. Political empowerment includes seats in parliament, how many um, ministers in parliamentary countries, cabinet members uh, here, number of years out of the last 50 that there has been a female prime minister or president. Guess what? Country is not on that list. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to look at, I just picked some countries to represent different, um, different parts of the world, and, but this one is a little different from the rest of them I'm going to show you because I wanted to just show you the top ten. Iceland is number one. So women are, in terms of overall parity, uh, women are about 87 percent compared to men. Going on down the line, you can see the Nordic countries are uh, substantially ahead of many of the other countries. and. Um, there are two very prominent world economies that are not represented on this list. Uh, the United States is one, and the second largest economy on Earth is now China, and it is not neither represented. So uh, Nicaragua is number 10, and this is sort of an example of a less developed country, but it still has uh, close to parity. So I'm going to now just give you some samples from around the world that are not in, in order of preference in terms of the top ten, but it does include every continent and it includes some very representative examples. 
uh, gender equality by overall rank. Norway from the Nordic countries is at 84%. New Zealand down under. Overall rank seventh with 77%. Germany is at 14th. And we'll see under political participation, Germany's number is skewed uh, a bit because of Merkel. She has been in office a long time and that's <coughs> sort of pulling up their number because of the political participation. Uh, South Africa is at 17th. The U.S. is 23rd uh, in overall gender rank out of 133 countries. And uh, part of what pulls us up is we do have 100% parity in education. Uh, so that pulls us up. China is 69th. Uh, they would be a little bit higher, we think, uh, but because of the one-child policy for so long, the gender ratio at birth is, is skewed. So that pulls them down to 69. Now let's look at labor force participation. Again, Norway is number one. Uh, their 23rd, um, their world GDP is 23rd, so they're not a huge, huge economy, but in terms of uh, how women are doing in the economy compared to men. They are number one. We're number six. We're all pretty rich compared to a lot of the world, whether we're women or men. And so that's part of that number, New Zealand at 15th. Uh, and you can see down the line. Uh, South Africa, it's interesting because in, in Africa, they are number one in terms of economic uh, parity. But in the world, they are down at 78th. Uh, China is 62nd, even though it's the second largest economy on earth. And many people think it will surpass the United States in this century. Here's where we do well. Education, as you can see, we're very, uh, we're very high. Uh, we're number one. Norway uh, and New Zealand are also tied with us for number one. South Africa is very high now. They have 99%. Uh, percent. They're close to parity. China and Germany as well. So uh, all of these countries look better on education than they do many of these other uh, measures. Health and survival. This is interesting because all these countries are very, very close. If you look at the percentages, 97 versus 96 versus 93 percent, however, China is last in the world. And again, that sex ratio at birth has pulled them way, way down uh, because it just screwed up the numbers so badly. But what it does tell you is that whether a country has a good health system or a bad health system, it's not necessarily differentiated on the basis of gender. Everybody's doing pretty well or everybody's doing sort of pretty well, uh, which was a surprise to me because we didn't look at really, really undeveloped countries. Uh, I didn't pull those out. Um, because I thought they weren't as comparable to what we were trying to look at in terms of economies. But countries where girls don't get enough food, they don't get medicine and that sort of thing. So that's why these countries are all so close to one another. Here we have political empowerment. Uh, this is how well we are doing or any, any country is doing in terms of women in political power. The countries with high scores generally have some kind of quota. Uh, Norway has quotas uh, for parliament. And when they got 40% of women in parliament, the women in parliament said, OK, we're going to make some changes here. <laughs> if you want to be a corporation chartered to do business in this country, you will have 40% females on your board of directors. So this is the kind of thing that can be done when women get into power. And people say, well, I don't want quotas. Quotas is such a bad word. Quotas, it's just not fair. Quotas are not good. 
I want some quotas. I want some new quotas that work as well as the old quotas that are not written down. And we know what those are. So one way to do it is to put in quotas, and Norway has been very successful with that. South Africa has quotas for local elections, uh, and the African National Congress, which is the largest political party, also has quotas. All the parties in Norway, all the parties as well as Parliament, uh, 40 to 50 percent female quotas, so it makes a real big difference. And again, the reason Germany looks so good here, they don't have any quotas, but Merkel's been in office since 2005, uh, almost 10 years, so she has pulled their number up. Um, and the same thing, Helen Clark in New Zealand uh, served nine years as prime minister, so that's why their number is so high. Uh, as they say in elementary school, needs improvement. <laughs> The two on the list that need improvement are China and the U.S. And in this context, China is actually ahead of us. So how are we going to overcome this? Well, here are the paths to leadership. Guess what? They're the same for women as they are for men. We get there the same way uh, men do. We can do it through family. Money can get you there. Patronage, education, fame, politics. We just heard about revolutionary politics, and I've forgotten Vilma's last name. Espin. Espin? Espin. Yeah, she was a major revolutionary in the Cuban Revolution, and uh, women in the communist countries tend to be higher in the government uh, many times. Certainly that's true in China uh, right now, and when they move transition to democracy, as we found in Macedonia, uh, they find that the capitalist, I should say transition to capitalist economy, not necessarily democratic government, the capitalists aren't so uh, forgiving in terms of, of gender. They think it's okay to even now say, well, we don't hire women or are you not cute enough? Uh, I have savvy on the list because I think savvy is important. What can that be? Well, it's smart. You know, it can be cleverness. It can be deviousness. We have some ruthless folks in the world who've gotten there that way, women and men. And one of the first ones I want to show you, because women have always been in leadership, one way or the other. But this woman was one of the first. She is Wu Zetian. She is the first and only woman that ever served as emperor of China from 690 to 705. So it was a long, long time ago. Her husband died, and she seized the throne, so to speak. Uh, there had never been a woman. She decided she wanted to do it. Uh, many people think she committed a couple of murders to get there. Uh, I don't know. I know. Um, Things haven't changed that much in the modern world. Lyndon Johnson burned down the courthouse before the votes could be recounted. Uh, nobody died, but somebody did get to be senator, and as a Texan, I think I can say that. Uh, so ruthlessness may have uh, played a part here, but some people thought she was murderous, but she was also something of a feminist. Uh, she challenged uh, all of the current thinking about the role of women, and, and she put an end to foot binding uh, during her term. It came back later, uh, but I think she was a very, very early feminist. Uh, so she got there through family and through being a savvy woman. Next we have v Vilma Rousseff, who is, as we speak, being challenged for the presidency of Brazil. There is a runoff on Sunday. She is running against a guy. A uh, big surprise. She is the 36th president of Brazil, and she got there through politics and through patronage. She was a protege of Lula da Silva. She was a revolutionary in her early days, and she fought in, uh, in the early militant Marxist 
activity. She was the editor of a Marxist newspaper. She was captured and jailed in the 1970s, and she was supposedly tortured. We don't know. She doesn't talk about it now. Uh, this category can al also include martyrdom. Uh, politics and, and heroes and martyrs are sort of sometimes interchangeable, but uh, many martyrs also become leaders. Uh, she was in, in De Silva's cabinet, and uh, then she became his chief of staff, and then she ran for president, and she won. So we don't know whether she will have another term or not, but we will find out on Sunday. Uh, sometimes people get to power by family, and here is a perfect example, Melinda Gates. Melinda Gates is a capable woman. There's no question about that. She has degrees in, let me see, engineering, and um, she has an MBA. But education was not what got her where she is. She's married to the world's richest man. Uh, and so that got her to a position of leadership in philanthropy. She does run the Gates Foundation. It is the richest foundation in the United States, and I think the 10th richest one in the world. And what happens when philanthropy uh, controls policy? Well, in this case, they control a lot of health policy because what the Gates Foundation chooses to fund is what gets done. Uh, and it's not just the Gates Foundation, it's all large foundations. They have their priorities and they fund their priorities and they become uh, leaders in that way in terms of philosophy and uh, what should uh, happen in society that can be accomplished with money. We may not always agree with it and I have no quarrel with their uh, priorities. Right now they're working with the Clinton Foundation uh, on a project called No Ceilings and it's about advancing girls around the world and I think that's a very good thing but nevertheless uh, Money can get you there, uh, family can get you there, and she is ranked number three in the 2013 list of the world's most powerful women. Here's somebody that didn't get there to, through family, money, or anything else, but education. Christine Lagarde, who is the head of the International Monetary Fund, the first woman to be there, and some of you may not know this, but uh, for a while there was talk that Bill Richardson might get this job. Uh, I don't know how incredible it was, but I just know it was out there. I am glad she is there. She comes from a family of academics. Uh, she has master ma three master's degrees, English, labor law, and social law. <coughs> And she was the chair of Baker and McKenzie, which is a very powerful, uh, very huge worldwide law firm. Before she got to be head of the International Monetary Fund, she was a, the trade minister of France, and she was also the minister of economic affairs. So she has a very solid educational background, and she is, I, I think you would say in France, she. Uh, was a counterpart uh, to Janet Yellen, who is now quite a leader in our own country, the chair of the Federal Reserve. So this is an, an example of one way to get there is education. Back to politics, this woman is of uh, China, Liu Yangdong. She is a vice premier of the People's Republic of China. She is the highest ranking woman in the Communist Politburo, which is really the ruling body of China. There are only 25 people in this inner circle, and she is one of two women. Uh, she has been there longer than the other woman, and she got there through patronage. She got there through working as well. She started as a, as a student in the Communist, well, everybody's in the Communist Party in China nominally, but she actually started working as a student, uh, worked her way up in the party, but then when she got to university level, she went to Tsinghua University, which is in central China, 
and it is known as the incubator for uh, people that are going to rise in the party. And most of the people that rise in the party, as we know, are men, but it is such an incubator that it is called the Tsinghua clique. And if you go through that university, it's sort of like being in the skull and bones or something like that. Uh, you, you are one of the insiders and you are going to rise in the party. And her, uh, her patron was Hu Xintao, the immediate past uh, president of China and head of the party. So he uh, took her under his wing, so to speak, and she rose in the party and is still there. Uh, just as an aside, she was vice chair of the Chinese Olympic Committee and the Beijing Organizing Committee for the uh, 29th Olympiad in Beijing in 2010. So she is a person who did it the old-fashioned way, patronage. Here's another politician, this one from our uh, continent of Africa, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, uh, who is the president of Liberia. And she has a little bit of everything in her background. She, she has a, a master's in public administration from Harvard. Uh, she was a director of the United Nations Development Program in the Regional Bureau from Africa. She has a doctorate in accounting, and she was the Minister of Finance in Liberia and head of the Liberian Development Bank before she became president. Uh, she was a political prisoner. She was put in prison for opposing uh, President Doe. Uh, he w there was, as you probably know, a 10-year civil war in Liberia. She opposed Doe. She was in prison. She got out, obviously, and is now president of the country. She won the Nobel Prize in 2011 for her work in uh, women's rights. And she has recently been in the news because, as we've all read in the papers, uh, Ebola is very bad in Liberia. It's one of the three top countries where Ebola is killing people. Over 2,500 people have already died. And she just released, about three days ago, a letter to the world begging for help. Uh, and she, it, she did it through the BBC. And I think Obama has promised 2,500 more medical personnel to go to Liberia. But she is a very strong woman and probably will remain in leadership, at least for the foreseeable future. How else can you get there? How about being famous? Anybody <laughs> recognize this picture? <laughs> Oprah. Uh, Oprah got famous and she got rich and she is a very, very good leader. Uh, especially in terms of uh, helping girls uh, in Africa primarily. She's the highest, no, not the highest earning woman celebrity of 2013. She's the highest earning celebrity. She earned $77 million in 2013. I don't know uh, how much she's earned so far. I, I, I'll have to call her up and ask her. Uh, people, I try to raise money for women's causes, and people are always asking me if I've talked to Jane Fonda. And I've started saying, no, will you call Jane for me? <laughs> what do they think? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> the Guardian of London has, has called uh, Oprah the most influential woman in the world. I don't know where she ranks on that ranking of Melinda Gates, but I'm sure she would be way up there. She spent over a hundred million dollars uh, in Africa on this school for, it's called the Leadership Academy for Girls in South Africa, and she says, I think appropriately, when you change uh, the path of a girl, you change a nation. Uh, here's a little clout for you. Uh, she delivered over a million votes for Barack Obama in the 2008 primary. And I'm not saying there was any connection. I have no idea. But in 2013, she was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. So how else do you get there? You get there through the system. Whatever system you're working in, some systems are more are kinder to women 
as leaders than other systems. One of the unkindest systems for women's leadership is corporate America and probably corporate hegemony all around the world. Uh, we have uh, 500 leading corporations. It's called the Fortune 500. Guess how many are headed by women? None. Anybody want to hear? No, there are four. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it varies between 10 and 20, depending on <coughs> who's up, who's down. But 20 is the most we've ever had. Okay. How about boards of directors of these corporations? What percent do you think are female? Overall, 10, but several hundred of the Fortune 500 have no women on their board. And I am working with a group that's trying to change that. The, the general uh, feeling about women's leadership or any group's leadership is that before you can really make change, you have to reach critical mass. And the generally agreed on number for critical mass is 30%. Why is that? Because if you have fewer, okay, let's say you're one woman, you're on General Motors board, or maybe two women, but anyway, you're just bitches with an agenda, right? I mean, you're just two of you. So you're advocating, but the other eight or 10 are all guys, and if they push their protégés, well, that's just sort of normal. And thank you, by the way, men who are sitting in this room, because your part's going to come later. You're different. Um, or you wouldn't be here. But critical mass is, is thought to be around 30%. If we got that many, then you can kind of do something without being accused of being a special interest group. You know, we still hear women are a special interest group. Well, we are the majority. Uh, but we're still special interest group. And the system can be very punitive to women. Think of the Middle East where women cannot go out without a man, a, re a male relative actually. They can be beaten in the street. Uh, those are extremely punitive systems. Uh, many systems aren't that blatant, but it's just not done that women uh, reach leadership. So. Uh, the system is very important. A lot of places, women are just now not quote unquote allowed to be leaders. Now this is where quotas come back uh, to, to help us. Uh, if you look here, the percentage of women, the type of quota, and I won't go down the list, everybody in here can read, uh, but where you have quotas, you have higher percentages of women uh, in the parliament. Uh, the U.S. and China, again, are not in this group. The U.S. has, anybody know the percentage of women in Congress? 18 and a half. Uh, we have 18 and a half, 20 percent in the Senate, and uh, 18 and a half in the House. So it comes out to a little bit over 18 overall, but uh, we're not anywhere near there. Uh, in China, there are 23 percent of the Communist Party uh, Congress. So we have a ways to go. Again, uh, these people, they all have um, proportional representation, the types of governments, that helps along with quotas. But proportional representation, if we remember our, our civics uh, classes, are uh, systems whereby the delegates are allocated by the percentage of votes. So, but we have a winner take all. So if somebody gets uh, the party uh, gets 49% of the vote, they, they get 0% of the leadership and so forth. But in a parliamentary system, that's why uh, you sometimes hear that the Greens or the so-and-so party uh, in Denmark or somewhere have achieved so many seats because they get that many votes, they get that many delegates. Uh, it, it's a good system. Uh, are we going to have it anytime soon? No. Uh, but there are groups in Washington that are working toward it, and I appreciate that they are because they are educating our electorate, I think, about what might happen. Uh, I want to look at some of the barriers to leadership quickly. Uh, we have a number. Uh, one is access to resources, and around the world this is very, very important. 
because many countries do not give girls equal access to resources as boys. Some countries that do, uh, like ours, uh, the please help sign on the left comes from the United States. In this country, uh, we have over 20% of our kids are in poverty. Over 30% of our kids are what we call food insecure. That means they don't have enough to eat. And that is true in this state. New Mexico has 29% of our kids in poverty. Uh, these kids, I was just reading today, how many of you saw in the journal uh, this food program, they're giving kids backpacks to take home uh, on the weekend because they don't have any food. And what did they find out? Well, that kid's getting home with a backpack, but there's a whole family there without enough food. So they are sharing that, that one backpack among the family, and the powers that be found out about this, so they are increasing that food allocation. But this is supposed to be the richest country in the world. Why? is this happening. We do not have access to resources allocated equally either between the 1% and the 99% or between girls and boys, even in this country. The second is a child from Asia. She has literally nothing. She has no health care. She has no clothes. She is eating off the street. Uh, this happens very often in many, many countries. The third is uh, emblematic of countries that do not allow girls to be educated. This is an all-male madrasa in the Middle East. So if you don't have education, you don't have access to the basics of life, you don't have food, it's very hard to get to be a leader. What are some of the other barriers? Uh, the culture might be considered one. Cultures differ around the world and they suppress women in many ways different ways around the world. Let's look at this. Uh, the first one up there on the left, if you can't read it in the back, it says, which Disney princess are you? What kind of message is that to little girls? Well, it's the princess industrial complex. You look, I just challenge you. You have trick-or-treaters next week. Count the princesses and count the little girls and maybe astronaut or some kind of robot engineering thing or something like that. Uh, you want to guess? You don't need to. You're going to have a lot of princesses. And there are something like uh, 12 different Disney princesses now. And, and people, you know, the kids know all their names and stuff. They're not all in the movies because Disney can't make that many movies. But all the stuff they sell, believe me, it's out there. This second thing uh, is not a strip club uh, poster. It's from Victoria's Secret. So this is what we can aspire to. Girls, want to look like that? Come to Victoria's Secret. And they've got a store now, it's, it's called Pink. It's in the mall, but it's for younger kids, you know, push-up bras for 11-year-olds. And I, what kind of message is that to a girl? What you can be when you grow up? God, you can be sexy. And I, I tell you who's getting into the act. I could not believe it yesterday. Whole Foods. We all love Whole Foods, right? Hippy dip shit, organic, the whole thing. <laughs> they have a new advertising campaign, and it's all about pure food. They want to get attention, and this is true in the business pages of saying, they're trying to take attention off of their high prices. <laughs> so <laughs> they are emphasizing their pure food. And they have a photo of a kid, it's a female kid, she's doing this, you know, like strength, and it's some really dumb um, slogan, I didn't even understand it, I do have a doctor, but I didn't know what that meant. Uh, however, the kid has on a pair of shorts, it's about a 10 year old, I have a 10 year old grandchild, so I'm pretty good at spotting ages of kids. The, the short shorts literally are at the pubic line. Whole Foods, now come on people, why are we sexualizing girls even in the grocery store? I, you know. So, that's Victoria's Secret, another culture. 
This one is a woman in a burqa in Afghanistan. Uh, literally, she is being erased from the culture. Uh, she cannot go out without that full rig on. My friend Carolyn Maloney, a uh, U.S. representative from New York, uh, her district is Manhattan. She got a lot of big banks in her district. She just gives them hell, which I love. Uh, but she borrowed a burqa and took it onto the floor of Congress to give a speech, and the men freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> Got to remove her from this. She can't do this. Finally, we have a very recognizable face, Hillary Clinton. This is a woman who aspires and achieves. She does aspire to leadership. She has been a leader. She will be a leader, whether she is elected president of the United States or goes on and does something else. And what is the message we're sending? We have the Hillary Nutcracker. And during the election last time, before she lost the, the primary season to Obama, I was in it, and I still am, in and out of Washington a lot. These things were everywhere. They were sold in the airports, on the street, in these stands the Hillary Nutcracker. Now what kind of message is that that we're sending to our girls? Not a very, and to our boys, because it says to the boys something about the place of women and the place of girls. So that's, uh, the culture is definitely a barrier to leadership. Money, I'll just skip over, but quickly tell you that women represent 40% of the world's labor force and they hold one big 1% of the wealth. There is no country in the world, zero zilch, nada, where women make the same as men for the same work. And if you think it won't happen to you, for those of you that are not in the workforce yet, let me tell you something. In this university, you are in the last meritocracy you will ever be in in your life. Don't think the workplace is the same as a university where if you do the work, make the grades, you're gonna get to the top. It's not yet. But it will be, and men, your part's coming up. <laughs> Women's access to credit, of course, is much lower than men's. You cannot start a business. Uh, you can't buy a house. There's a lot of stuff you can't do without access to credit, so we've got to change that, too. Now, patrons in the system are, of course, a barrier to women and women's leadership. You know, you've heard that expression, the more things change the more they stay the same. First picture up there on the left, guess what that is? That is Lyndon Johnson, President Johnson, signing the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Look behind him. You see many white men, one kind of brown one, no women. There were 50 people in the room and none of the women, no women were in the room. But that was then. This is now, or almost now. It's George W. Bush signing the first abortion ban at the federal level in the United States. Look behind him. It's that same club. I bet many of them are the same guys. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's the system, folks. And it ain't working for us all the way. This is a picture of it's supposed to represent a corporate board, and it's, as you can see, all legs. And there's one woman only, it's not a whole woman, just one of the legs is female. This comes out of Time Magazine. Uh, they did the announcement, there weren't enough women <coughs> for them to have two whole legs represented in the women's board membership. So they, she just got, we just got a half a leg. Okay. Who can help women along the path to leadership? All that stuff we've been talking about, but I'm gonna cut right to the chase. Men, this is your part. You know why? Because men, and, and I know that not all the men in this room or even in this university are at the top of anything. A lot of men feel like damn, I'm at the bottom just along with everybody else, and in this economy, it's certainly understandable. But men do still control and lead most of the institutions in the culture, in the economy, in the education system, 
around the world. If you did a study uh, just right now, right here in this university, you are going to find that the women faculty members are not being paid equitably with the men, and that's not just my opinion. This university is under investigation by the U.S. Justice Department for wage discrimination against women. So, we're no exception, but men in this room, some of you are already leaders, many of you will become leaders. When you get to be head of that Fortune 500 company, I want you to look around and say, where are the women? I'm gonna promote them. And some of our presidents have done better than others about putting women in the cabinet. We're inching up, but we're not electing enough women. We're not mentoring enough women. Our girls are getting the wrong messages, and that's where if, when you become or are a father, you can change that. I was so pleased a couple of weeks ago, my son called me and he said, guess what? And I said, what? And he said, your granddaughter did not want the girl set of Legos. She said they weren't any good. She wanted the boy set. <laughs> so I thought that was great. But, but my question has to be, why is there a girl set of boy? You know, the girls are pink or something. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, man, that is your challenge. That is the last word. You have the last word. I want to thank the guys in this room because, uh, boy, do we need you. But we need us all, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Um, so one thing that really jumped out at me was your focus on quotas and how that makes such a difference. And I'm wondering what quotas you would like to see instituted here, and whether or how you think we can get those instituted. Okay, well, the question is quotas, and I think politically, uh, there are some small steps that are being made. I, some of you who have been around as long as I have can maybe help me remember, but I think it's been at least 30 <coughs> years the Democratic Party did put in a quota, and it's still in existence, that the delegates uh, from the different districts to the convention have to be 50% uh, female. So I think that is good. Uh, when affirmative action was first passed uh, in the 1970s, I guess, um, <coughs> the universities put in kind of quotas in this way. Uh, they had to interview as many women as men from the different positions. Did they hire that many? No. Uh, but they covered their ass, so to speak, by saying, well, we interviewed women. And God, we just couldn't find any qualified women. And uh, we still hear that. We need a binder. We need a binder <laughs> for the women. We do. So, Politically, I think it's, it's a non-starter in this country, and I'm sorry to see that because the women in, in uh, Norway have accomplished a lot. And you know what? Nobody's died of it. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have like a... Oh. Here and then here. Oh, I just wanted to thank you because there was so much interesting stuff. I learned so much uh, about that woman in China. I mean, that's amazing. Um, so I wanted to thank you for this presentation, which was terrific. I, I just wanted to add one little thing, though, and just for people to think about. Um, I was fascinated that you mentioned, for example, um, how the figures go up when a woman had, for example, Angela Merkel has been Angela Merkel has been around for a long time, or the. Um, Prime Minister of New Zealand and so forth as a woman. And also, I, I loved it when you showed Vilma, uh, Vilma Rousseff because I'm very worried about um, Sunday. But I also wanted to mention, and I'm sure you agree with this, that it's not enough to be a woman in a position no. of power because we have uh, Margaret Thatcher, you know, and look at what she did for women, not. Or we have this woman in Brazil right now, Marina, who yes. actually ran against um, Dilma and 
came in third and has now thrown her weight to the right. So um, if Dilma loses, it's going to be her fault. And she's a woman who's against abortion, right. who's against gay rights, who's um, you know an evangelical Christian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, I just think it's important that it not only be women or men who appoint women, or but men and women, or women and men who have um, women's rights. Absolutely, at, at absolutely, and you're correct, of course. But not all women are feminists, and not all men are anti feminists. And I will vote for a feminist man any day over a right wing woman that wants to take my rights. Uh, certainly, I will do that, and, and you're right. But there, is, there are some places where there's an intersection that is very interesting. Uh, even in the U.S. Congress, the conservative women. Uh, often will vote uh, the right way on something like pay equity. They, they might not do it on abortion, but they will move a little bit. And the, the uh, Stupak Amendment to the Obamacare legislation, to the Affordable Care Act, which outlawed coverage for abortion, had we had uh, almost all the women voted against that amendment across party lines, but we didn't have enough women <coughs> as a critical mass to make the difference. So sometimes the women will come over, the men almost never do. And I think that's the difference. But it's a very, very well taken point. We, we, not just any woman. There was a question over here. Uh, I just wanted to uh, talk about like the DNI index or the DINI index of how like it's a equality within the country. And I was, I was seeing that even though like Norway wasn't, weren't like the rich, it wasn't like the richest one, but they were like in the top there. Them and Denmark are like the top two for the Gini index, which measures equality within all of its citizenship. So that was interesting to me. Yeah, the Gini index, for those of you that couldn't hear the question, is a measure of income inequality across the population, women and men uh, alike. And um, I just uncovered a, a shocking and horrible and very disappointing statistics in, in doing research for a TV show I did this morning uh, on the state of the New Mexico economy. And the, these numbers come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and some professors here that prepared a presentation that was about four pages down in Google, which is too bad because it was very informative. But New Mexico is number one in income inequality in this country overall. Uh, we're number, really yeah, we're number one in, uh, in non-job creation, we're number two in poverty, not because we came up, but Mississippi <laughs> came, Mississippi went down. Uh, we're way number one in teen pregnancy, uh, so it's not a surprise, but I think uh, your point is a good one. Yes? Um. I'm thinking about, you know, you mentioned philanthropy a couple of times, and I'm thinking about things that I've read about philanthropy that kind of, kind of like, debunk the idea of, like, billionaire generosity, in the sense that they can give amounts that sound huge to me, but as a percentage of their income, not so impressive. And the fact that the tax structure is set up such that it's really, like, a win for them. I mean, it's a huge win in the PR department, but also, I mean, it's, it's like they're not even losing money. They're just giving money to the foundation, but they're, and it, that's money that's just not going into the public coffers. But I think it's, it's not going into taxes. It's kind of like the foundation is a tax shelter in a certain way. They can either create the foundation or pay more taxes than they create the foundation, where they can spend the money exactly how they want. That is right. That is all true. And are, are you familiar with the Gates Foundation's relationship with Monsanto? And, you know, that's causing a lot of suicides in India. It's causing a lot of environmental problems all over the world. Well, I always say that they will fund the opera and uh, pollute the rivers behind yes. the opera house. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very careful. But it does not... Um, the fact of that, which is a very important fact, uh, does not change the, 
the dynamic that a lot of money can transfer into power and the Gates Foundation, uh, for example, for just one, uh, they do have a lot to say about moral health policy because they fund it. And uh, the Koch brothers, it's not philanthropy because they can't do it under the tax laws and be a, a charity. Uh, but boy, is that money equals power? Absolutely. And uh, your, your point about the taxes is absolutely on. Our tax system is very regressive, and even though we claim it is, that it's a progressive tax system, it's getting less and less so as the years go by, and there is a gender component to that because women are the lowest earners. And uh, if we ever go to a so-called fair tax or flat tax, it's gonna take a big bite out of the low-income workers. Women are the majority of minimum wage workers, 75%, and that's not kids, that's adult women, so. Thank you. One last question, word, anything? Thank you all. culture were really striking with the Disney princesses and the Hillary Nutcracker. And I feel like there's been a lot in the news in the last couple of years about culture, like with rape culture and the Stephen Bill rape case, and then recently the cancellation of the speaker at Utah State because of the death threats. How do we change that? That strikes me as something that people who aren't involved in education and politics in the system that way well, still I are so inundated with that. How do we trust We are, that? and uh, well, we just have to maybe get back in the streets. I don't know, but I do think the NFL mess has has called attention to it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just tell you a quick story about the woman that got threatened over the video game. Uh, I, I've had a long life, and I've done a lot of stuff, and some of it's been more successful than other uh, the stuff. Uh, but one of the things I used to do, because I was the head of uh, the National Organization for Women in Wichita, Kansas, and we had one of the few late-term abortion clinics in the country, and um, our abortion doctor got shot, actually. And I was head of now, and I used to defend that clinic every Saturday, I and others. And um, I watched my back every time I went out, because I got a lot of death threats. Okay, well that's expected. It's abortion, it's, it's a hot topic, it's highly controversial. Fast forward 20 years later, I was involved in a national controversy about a golf club. Letting women in or not, I got more death threats and more serious death threats over the golf club than I did the abortion clinic. I bet you did. And, and that tells us something about, I had, to hire, I had to hire bodyguards, I had to get a bulletproof vest, golf. So that's sort of like where we are culturally and what I think we just have to keep calling them out. And one of the best ways to do it uh, is in the pocketbook. If we can mobilize enough to say, well, I'm, you know, the Hobby Lobby thing is a good example. Uh, if we can say, get out there, get in the street, which I have done. And by the way, they're Hobby Lobby, I think we have once a month. <laughs> so join me, because I'm out there on that street corner. Uh, but, you know, we just gotta keep on keeping on. I don't know, put pressure on the media com companies or something. Uh, during that Augusta thing, I got calls from the big corporations really calling me out for making trouble. They, they they wanted to play golf. <laughs> Poor babies. <laughs> so I have to tell you, in the end, though, we did get a woman in, and it took 10 years. And the and way was we, it Condoleezza? Condoleezza, Condoleezza Rice. Rice and, it was uh, not. And, a, and another woman <laughs> from the banking community. But I, at that point, I just thought, let's get some woman in. And it got no publicity, but we hit them in the pocketbook. We sued several of the companies. We collected $80 million uh, for the women that worked there, and that's where we broke them. Because they wanted to play golf, but they didn't want to play bad enough to pay $80 million in green fees. So. <laughs> well, just really quickly, I mean, that relates, I think, to what I'm thinking about the Steubenville. You know, what happened in Steubenville, I think the one thing that's really precedent 
setting is that Dean Doe's parents, you know, press charges. Yes. And, you know, and also charges for the first time were being brought against the school officials. Actually, in January, that superintendent is going to come to trial for destroying evidence and things like that. And I think that that kind of thing is going to start setting some good precedents. I hope so. And I think the more publicity, of course, that it gets, the better. But we're swimming against a pretty strong tide. I, I, I wouldn't be uh, horribly optimistic about the timeline. I think eventually uh, things will change. And the sooner we get women in leadership, by and large, not one for one, but by and large, I think the better off we'll be. I, I don't think uh, conservative women want to be ripped at gunpoint any more than liberals do. So, okay, our time is up, and thank you. <laughs>